Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, tonight we're excited to welcome Jane from Beef Breeding Services to discuss semen collection and assessment with us all. Um, we'd like to thank Jane for joining us for a webinar tonight. Just a few little housekeeping things. Um, if you have any questions, please send through the chat function. Um, and then there's also a Q&A button. So if you have any questions about Jane's presentation, be sure to send them through um, as a Q in, from the Q&A function and we can um, answer those either at the end or as we're going. Um, I'll now hand over Jane to start tonight's webinar. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much, guys, and thanks for having me. Um, so tonight I'm just going to talk about a very basic overview of semen collection methods and basic assessment um, on semen, whether it's crush side motility, the morphology of it all, um, and just a basic rundown of morphology as well. If you have any questions, just chime in at any time. Um, yeah, and if there's anything else that you need me to clarify, just let me know. I don't know. Okay, so a little bit about BBS. So we're comprehensive, tailored and progressive. Beef breeding um, is a diverse artificial breeding hub, hub assisting stud commercial and special interest breeders to achieve ex exceptional benchmarks. Uh, we have storage facilities and labs in Brisbane at Wacol, as well as in Rockhampton. Uh, we have three on-farm technicians, so doing AI, uh, preg testing. We also semen testing. We have a vet who does the BBSEs. Um, and we also have a large range of consumables for your AI needs, things like that, or your drugs to sink. Um, we do liquid nitrogen runs all across Queensland. And we also are running AI schools once a month. So two schools of four to six students every month. Um, so originally we were a government owned facility and we've been privately purchased about eight years ago. Uh, so we are no longer just beef. So we also have an equine breeding facility. So at the minute we have about five stallions standing and we're probably down to about 60 mares but in the height of the season we had about 100 mares here um, we also do goat and sheep reproduction and dog collections and processing as well okay so basically why we collect semen and process it for artificial breeding um, and why we are semen testing. So semen testing and morphology testing are a great low cost way of assuring your herd's genetic gains, productivity and profitability. With artificial breeding, the quickest way to build your herd and semen testing to help select size for single or multi-size herds, which help tighten up your calving periods, giving you a more consistent weaning weights for sale. Uh, semen collection is also a low cost insurance policy. So we find a lot of clients, especially after bull sales, will send bulls into centre um, and we'll collect and process. Um, and so that if something happens when they get that bull home, he breaks his leg, he gets a snake bite, any of that sort of stuff, um, they've got a bit of, bit of semen in the tank to do what they want to do, whether it's IVF, ET stuff, um, yeah, or just standard AIs. Uh, we also have a domestic centre here. So at the minute we have two bulls that are standing that are owned by an overseas owner in South Africa. So he collects semen consistently and everything gets shipped overseas. Uh, we also collect for marketing. So certain clients will get an order from overseas uh, and we'll fill it, say they want 300 straws or something to go to Canada for whatever or New Zealand or Yep, so they'll send them in and we'll collect them and ship overseas. I got any questions on any of that? All good. Righty, eh? So there's two ways to collect balls. So the first way is AV or artificial vagina. It is the most effective way to collect semen. So not only do you get better volume, better motility, better density, so a thicker sample, so you've got more cells to be able to make more straws. 
Um, it's the least stressful way to collect the semen on the ball. So therefore, if they come in with a bad morphology, it doesn't take as long to clear up because uh, they're not under as much stress from being electro ejaculated. Um, unfortunately, most bulls do require some sort of training, which can take uh, oh, up to a few weeks to sort of get them kick-started. If they're a bit low, some bulls have a higher libido and just naturally come in and will jump straight away, which is great. Um, the only problem with AV is that it's not suitable for on-farm collections always. Um, with the bulls that we have in the Queensland area, because they're not as handled as often, they're generally on a larger scale um, property. So they're not used to people being in and around them. So it's better just for an electro ejaculation collection. All right, so this is just a little video of one of the bulls. If it's gonna let me play, um, of how an AV um, collection is done. If I can play it. Maybe not. Okay, so it doesn't look like it's gonna let me play. Okay, yeah, move on. Um, so the other collection method, which I'm sure a lot of you guys would have witnessed with bulls, people, vets and technicians coming out to do semen testing is electro ejaculation. So this is the most common method. Uh, Pope is placed in the rectum of the bull and uses an electrical current to stimulate the seminal vesicles. Uh, it's the safest option, providing the crush in the surrounding area is of safe and acceptable standards. Um, if conducted correctly, the stress on the bull, bull will be low. When using the EJ method, collecting bull's behavior, behavior um, watch, sorry, watching the bull's behavior is a must. Um, it'll guide you through how is the best way to collect him. So if he sort of starts looking a bit upset, you slow it down a bit if he you know, doesn't look like there seems to be much going on or he doesn't seem to be engaging with the probe. You need to start moving the probe around or maybe going up with a few amps or things like that. Um, so the idea with the EJ is just to minimize, get the best collection with a minimal amount of stress. So I had a vet student come out, so she had a great time. <laughs> And then the second photo is just a general setup of our crush side for when we are semen testing. So that's out in Western Queensland in Blackhall. Right, so the assessment of semen. So the main things we look at when we're assessing semen, whether it's crush side or in the lab here, is motility. So that's alive and what's progressively moving. So moving forward. Um, the velocity, which is the speed of what the sperm is moving. So whether it looks a little slow and steady or it looks like it's vigorous and it's, you know, high, high energy. Um, density or the concentration. So how many sperm per mil of ejaculate that we're going to get? And the morphology, uh, which is the structural soundness of the individual sperm. Righto. So here we have two pictures of motility. So we've got a mass motility over there on the left hand side and the diluted. So it's one to 25 on the left, uh, right hand side. So it's good sometimes just to have a quick look at the mass motility to, just to see if it's looking like it's alive and it's got a nice cloudy thunderstorm appearance to it. So it gives you an idea of the density. But to really get a good gauge on the motility of the semen, it's best to dilute it out. So like we've done here over in the right hand side, just so we can see each individual sperm. So they were also videos, but it's not going to work. Um, so we can see those individual sperm and we can get a better idea of what is actually moving. Because sometimes when we're having a look at just a mass motility or a 
lightly diluted sample, you can only, a lot of the live cells that may have high velocity will be pushing a lot of the dead cells. So it'll give you a false indication of how much is actually motile. Um, so for beef week this year, we did a trial with Australian cattle vets where we collected a bull and then we took the sample and we tested it at, at raw, one to one, one to two, one to five, one to 15 and one to 25. Now across all of that, what came out was that was nearly a 25% difference in motility from the one to one to the one to 25, just because the computer, so we use a computer aided assessment, semen assessment system here. So it takes out a lot of the human range, but by using that and gauging that there was a potential 25% difference that can make or break your bull when it comes for sale and things like that so it may come up saying that it's you know at a mass motility it might be say 80 percent at a guess but when it's diluted out it might only be a 60 65 percent um you can also then see if it's got any mid-piece problems or head detached problems things like that so that you're not getting down the track and going oh there's something wrong with the bull you know we need to have a look at it. So here's some pictures of density. So when we're collecting a bull, density wise, the age of the bull is a big um, indicator as well. Um, whether he's urinated in the sample, um, the thicker the sample and the more white the sample, the better we're going to be able to, or the more straws that we're going to be able to make. Um, and it's more that his, if it's just, and it's just a crush side, um, that the more that he's then ejaculating when he's serving a cow. So you've got more cells, so more chances of the cow then getting pregnant. Right, so morphology. So morphology, it's a great tool. Um, it examines the shape and the health of the sperm and determines the percentage of normal sperm in the ejaculate. So it's important that this, as this studies have found that the semen quality, particularly that with a high percentage of normal sperm is consistently related to a higher number of calves on the ground a more compressed and a more compressed calving. Therefore, it is more likely that a sexually active bull with a higher percentage of normal sperm will be fertile with one of a low percentage of normal, more fertile than one of a low percentage of normal sperm. So he's got to tick quite a few boxes by the time, you know, he's serving a cow. So there's lots that goes into just the semen alone. Um, so there's a group so that go through of morphologists and we all go through an assessment process of five samples every year with the University of Queensland. So it's a very, we use a very high powered microscope. So a DIC microscope. So it's not your standard that come, that you'll see come out crush side. Um, it'll need to be sent back to a lab to be analyzed. Um, so there's many different types of abnormalities. There's eight gradings that we count. So normal is one of them. And then we'll, I'll go through the rest as we chug along. Um, but uh, although a passing morphology doesn't always guarantee a high fertility, continued failure almost certainly means that the relatively low fertilization rates by retesting the bulls two that fail um, it also gives them that second chance because it may have just been a moment in time. He may have had a dose of three day. He may have had been through a heat wave or a cold snap, things like that. Um, but the aim is to identify those animals that have a genetic weakness or a predisposition of being affected by outside factors. So, Morphology, although it's not hereditary or genetic, the way a bull adapts to stress is 
So he's not quite his temperament, but how he handles stress is genetic. So I always use the analogy of mum may be really high strung and a real stressor. Dad might be chilled as cool as a cucumber. And then who do you sort of take after? Um, you know, are you a stressor like mum or are you a stressor like dad? So for an example, I've had a bull that we've collected and we've used in trials. Now this bull we collected for probably about six months, consistently weekly, this bull every week was high percentage of vacuoles. So he like ridiculously high, like 60 to 70% high in vacuoles. Now he's gone home and he's in a paddock with roughly 20 cows and he's in that paddock all year round. So although he's still getting cows and calf, you know, he's getting cows and calf across the whole year, not in a six week or eight week controlled mating. Um, we then tested six of his sons three times. So the three of those bulls came back that consistently didn't show high signs, signs of high vacuoles or other defects, but the other three showed consistent high signs of high vacuoles. So if you are in your enterprise steering everything, every male, that's not a big factor for you. But if you're going on to then breed bulls, you're then going to be starting to breed that stress or lack of adapt, lack of being able to adapt to stress into your herd. So it's something just to keep an eye on. We have other regular clients that you know, do large numbers of bulls, sort of 70, 80 bulls each year. And each year those numbers get lower and lower of bulls that we fail. So I think last year when we tested out of, I think, 78 bulls that we tested for them, only three failed. So that's because they're using morphology. It's not the be all and end all, but it is a tool to be able to help, you know, gather data, and help you guide, you know, how you want to go in your herds. All right, so this is a picture of some normal serm. So they look nice, neat, tidy, tails are straight, heads look like they should. And we have proximal droplets, which is your first defect. So proximal droplets aren't anything to stress about majorly. Um, they are signs mainly common in young bulls, sexually immature bulls. If a bull is being ejaculated, so if we had a bull here on centre and we were collecting him three times a week um, consistently, that would be speeding up his spermatogenesis. So his spermatogenesis is from when a sperm is created to when a sperm creates a pregnancy. So that's the whole 78 days. Um, so if we were to speed that up and make him ejaculate more than what he would naturally, we would then create a problem with vacuole, uh, with proximal droplets. Um, it also is a sign of interference with maturity. So basically anything can cause a defect or cause problems with the morphology. It's a stress of some description, whether it's environmental, nutritional, um, physical, yeah, anything within themselves. So the best way to get rid of proximal droplets is one, to let him age a little bit, but also he needs to go out with cows and it's good just to retest in that six to eight week period. So it's, an, it's not a, a big one. Uh, mid pieces. So mid pieces, the, I don't know if you can see my little arrow. So the mid piece is this section here um, from the base of the neck to halfway down the tail. It's a thicker piece. I don't know if you can see that quite there, but and that's called the mitochondria. So there's several different types of defects in that. We have a DAG defect. We can have a DMR where it's just bent back on itself. Sometimes the proximal droplet will go down and the when it's shedding and it'll cause a tear in the membrane, which will cause the tail to flip back over itself. Um, temperature shock, say we're collecting in freezing cold weather or severely hot weather and the semen comes, 
like is released from the ejaculated from the bull at say 36 degrees and the outside temperature is say 45 degrees or negative two, those are gonna have a severe impact and potentially cause mid piece problems. But the other thing in his physical temperature, if he has problems thermoregulating his testes, so when it's cold, they suck them up closer to their body so that they stay warm and they can control the temperature. When it's hot, bulls will drop their testes again to cool. So that's their thermal regulating. If a bull has trouble being able to rise and fall his testes, you'll also see a lot of mid-piece problems. Um, and we have other things like multiple tails and stump tails, and that's just where they've gone through the spermatogenesis and a stress has occurred at that point in time. Now, this DAG defect over here on the left-hand side, he is one of two that they say are a hereditary defect. When a bull shows signs of this DAG defect in a percentage higher than 30% of the sample, with no other signs of defects. So the rest of the sample looks really healthy, but he's, that DAG defect just comes out in about 30% or more. Um, it is a potential hereditary defect. So it's worth always retesting a bull no matter what anyway, but just keeping an eye on it and retesting it. Um, and maybe if that's not something that, you know, you don't want, uh, coming through in your bulls, maybe it might be something you need to look at and evaluate with the bull. Tail and head defects. So this is a fairly common one too in bulls that haven't been out with cows um, for a very long time, sometimes in younger bulls and then sometimes in significantly older bulls. So what we call a rusty load. So on the right-hand side, you'll see all these detached heads. So a rusty load is basically a breakdown of semen in the epididymis. So it's where he hasn't been ejaculating. So younger bulls don't quite have the libido like older bulls, so they won't ejaculate themselves in a paddock. Um, whereas the older bulls are a bit tired and they don't ejaculate, they've lost their libido. So they won't ejaculate in the paddock either. Um, if, and this is of course, if they've been out of cows for quite a significant period of time. So this will sit in the epididymis and slowly disintegrate. Um, another, way, another cause of head and tail defects is three day. So you'll quite often see this detached heads in bulls that have had three day. Sometimes this can occur for up to six months or so. Um, it's not overly common, but that it'll last that long. But you do tend to see a lot of detached heads while the bull is recovering through three day. Um, and heat stress is also another cause. Um, they go through a big heat wave and anything like that. So there's a few other different types of head and defect, head and tail defects. So you have a multiple tail or a double tail. So you can see this little fella down the bottom here with this large head. And he's also got a pale centre vacuole across him. So he's got a whole lot of nasty going on. Um, in general, with a rusty load, if it is just an average age bull or a young bull, and he does seem to have this rusty load, if you're testing him crush side, if you dilute up, out enough, you'll be able to see it on the microscope, on the crush side microscope. You, what you should do is just put him aside, leave him till the end of your testing and then run him back through. So give him a, you know, a bit of time to recover and then semen test him again. And quite often he'll come back perfectly fine. Piriforms. Um, so piriforms are misshapen heads. They generally got like a pear shape to them. Um, this occurs in young overconditioned bulls, which are similar with vacuoles. So generally piriforms are unseen vacuoles. So they're little holes in the head that you can't quite see. So they might be on the other side or they might be like this fella here in the middle. He sort of looks like he 
his will be in this side part just here. Um, it's a common uh, defect, but it's not something that happens all the time. Um, knob, knobbed acrosomes. So knobbed acrosomes are also part of, um, similar to the DAG defects. So they are also classified anything over 30% with no other major, sorry, over 20%. Um, they're also considered a genetic defect with no other defects prominent. Um, again, this can be caused due to environmental um, effects as well. So again, nutrition, uh, temperature, sneezed wrong on the wrong day, you know, depending on the breed as well, um, bulls are just, some bulls are more sensitive to it. And depending along the timeline of when that stress occurred through his spermatogenesis is how it affects the sperm. Uh, vacuoles and teratoids, these are my favorite. Um, shouldn't have favorites, but I do. Um, these are the nasties. So although most of the other defects can't actually fertilize an egg because one, they can't move. So mid pieces, their engines are broken. So they've got nothing to drive them to be able to get to the egg. Anything with an acrosome problem. Uh, so knobbed acrosomes, piriforms, swollen ac acrosomes, they can't actually fertilize an egg either because they can't, the acrosome, once it attaches to the egg, it's sort of like a magic password, at, you know, at the door and that the egg will then accept the semen. Vacuoles and teratoids. So teratoids are a, a blown out version of a vacuole. So they're a highly um, degenerative version of a vacuole. So you'll see this little fella down the bottom here. He's got lots and he's misshapen and things like that. And they sort of look like they have a lot of craters. But these ones with diadem, so the three just across the middle or the four just across the middle there, they can actually fertilise an egg because the external structure of the semen is still intact and still fine. So what happens with that if it does fertilise? You're going to probably cull your cow if you haven't checked your semen. Um, just due to the fact that it will get through, it'll create a pregnancy and then early on in the pregnancy, you'll actually lose that embryo because I always explain it like a Lego kit. So you go to the shops and you buy a Lego car. In that kit, you're building it. So in the head of a semen is all this DNA and you're building this car and you get to the part where you need to put your wheels on, but you don't have the wheels in your box. You're missing that DNA. So then you can't continue. There's no point in having a car if you don't have a set of wheels. So you just abort the project. And that's exactly what happens um, in the pregnancy with vacuoles. Vacuoles are probably the most common thing I see in morphology. Um, we get a lot of it with feeding. So bulls that can't tolerate um, a high grain diet, bulls that um, struggle with heat, um, a lot of transport, the stress of going through a sale, um, all those sorts of things will create vacuoles. Right. And swollen acrosomes, this is the last uh, one of the eight. So a swollen acrosome, I don't know if you can sort of see, you can see on the top of these heads of the semen here, there's sort of like a halo type thing or like a little ruffle. Um, or a ballooning of it. So that's where the acrosome is actually coming away from the semen, it's sort of inflamed, I guess, is starting to come apart. Um, like I said before, anything that has an acrosome defect can't actually fertilize an egg. So it can also be an indicate indication of aging semen, sort of like our detached heads. It's not as common though. Um, or it can be a subfertile bull. Now, if we are doing a thaw on a straw, 
prior to inseminating, which we often do just to ensure the quality of the semen before we start AIing. Um, if we see a lot of these, there's been a freezing process. So what happens when you're processing semen, there's water along that membrane. And if the correct ingredients, I guess, aren't in the diluent, it will then cause the semen. So in, uh, in diluent, we have something called glycerol. And what it does, it sort of turns the water to like a jelly within the cell. So when it, or an antifreeze in your radio, radiator fluid or something like that. So when it gets really, really cold and we're putting it through a freeze process, it turns it to jelly. So when ice, if you're freezing and you get ice, it will then pierce the membrane and leak the water, which will kill the sperm and create swollen acrosomes. Um, so sometimes we see that in semen that's not very motile in a post-thaw situation. Yeah. And we have a few other different types of cells. So basically, overall, every little bit is important as the next bit. They all tell a story. But most importantly, we can have a look at these and we can count our 100 cells doing a morphology and we can take into account the crush site assessment. Um, and if we don't take into account these other cells, or the bull's history for the last six to eight weeks, we can't get a true idea of what's actually going on. So on either side of this slide, I've got what they call precursor cells. Now they're like little fluffy snowballs. Um, what they are, you'll see them when there is pus potentially present. Um, they can occur when there's vesicles inside the testicles that are blocked or there's some sort of infection that we can't see. Now, the middle picture is epithelial cells. You'll get this in older bulls um, and sometimes in younger bulls as well. And again, it's sort of a bit like cleaning the pipes out. So epithelial cells are basically just dead skin cells from up in the sheath. Um, and yeah, they'll, you'll get a bit of that sometimes if there's nothing much moving around and happening. So that's basically a really rough overview. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them and go over anything that you would like to know about. So does anyone do any semen testing currently? Um, oh. uh -huh. oh, I can see you've got your hand up there, Sharon. I'll just give you permission to talk. We, we test our bulls yearly and also our young bulls before sale. Yep. Just gives us a guide because we've got a small herd. We, want, we don't want to miss, miss, have a bad season. So we know what we're contending with straight up from the word go. Yep. Yeah, no, it's, it's so important. Like bulls at the end of the day, they have one job. Um, and if you miss that window, you can potentially blow out a whole year's worth of Breeding. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone else has got any questions and they prefer to um, talk rather than sending something through, you can just press the um, raise hand and I'll give you permission to speak as well if you prefer.
Hello, this is Jenny Underwood here. Hi, Jenny, how are you? Very well. Look, we came late, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> we uh, are wondering if, um, say, bulls that are about to go through puberty or are going through puberty, yep. if they have a problem occur, say, with hot feed mm -hmm. or something yep. like that, can that wreck them for life? Um, it's the length that they're exposed to. Um, depend it would depend on the results of your first test and how things are sort of going um generally no if it's just a you know sort of a six-week feeding program or something like that it might knock them around for a little bit but again it comes back to how they adapt to that stress some bulls are perfectly fine and don't stress at all when they're on those high grain diets ready for getting ready for sale prep um, and then there's some bulls that, you know, can struggle with it. It just comes back to that consistent testing um, and testing over a period of time. So it's ideal to sort of test before you put on to feed and then, you know, during your feed. And then obviously you've got that window where you guys have to test prior to sale. So whether it's that 60 days before sale, to put in for the sub sheet and things like that. Yeah, I mean, we had a situation a while ago where um, we couldn't even get crushed side semen. There was oh, no was, semen. At all. He wasn't producing semen at all. No. Yeah. Okay. We couldn't get it. Couldn't get any semen. Um, it was yeah. the seminal fluid, and yep. at some point he was tested a couple of times. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, how old was he? Um, probably with the first time he was tested, maybe 16 months. Okay, so he's sort of, he should be old enough to... Yeah, it could have been a little bit younger, but it was sort of around that puberty yeah. time, I suppose. Yeah. Look, there's bulls that, you know, in all different... And every breed is different. Like Wagyu's you can collect from 11, 12 <laughs> months old. Like, they're free. <laughs> Um, you know, Brahmins, they're that little bit older. Like every breed has their little niche. Um, but as a standard rule, that 16 to 18 months is generally you're starting to be fine. Um, yeah. I know the, the, vet, the vet wasn't sure what it was either. Um, yeah, I wouldn't imagine. Little... Yeah, I wouldn't imagine, like being that young, he wouldn't have been on like a high high dose of feed for like it'd have to be a lot of hot feed for an extended period of time i would imagine um, yeah, really yeah, good so he could have like, just perhaps got, got crook he could have yeah um wasn't any signs of three day or any of that sort of stuff he could have had they, there's a lot of stuff that can happen in their testes that you don't actually get to see um and it's hard if they're not going to give you any sample. Sometimes being able to have a look at the sample, even if it's just seminal fluid, to see if there is any of these precursor cells or epithelial cells or just other cells that may be able to help indicate a problem. Um, but, yeah. What, what I, effect can giving tick fever um, to a young bull too? Can that affect their semen at all? Um, it's just the stress of... The injection but generally it's not a major those quick one-off things don't traumatize them um, so not producing semen at all if that's come from a stress it would have to be a fairly significant traumatic stress and I would say it's more a um, part of his like his functioning his physiology things like that yeah. so I'd say there's probably something that's happened more up in his testes whether he's injured himself or he's got a blockage or something like that. Has did have you kept him or you've no. yeah. <laughs> he got a couple of goes and um yeah straight to works. Yeah, that's it. Like you know, I always say minimum two tests, ideally three, but if you've you know if you've got the same result, it's what's the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again. So yeah. You can spend your money on other things to be insane, I think. That's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. You're welcome, Jane.
Has anybody else got any other questions for Jane? Yeah, I'll just give you permission to talk, Scott. Um, you'll just have to go off mute to be able to talk. Really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just just wondering with the three day. Yep. Um, yeah, we've had a bad season with three day. Yeah. Just wondering, like young bulls, working bulls, how like is there long term effects? Or is it um, there, is, there there is potentially. Um, I've had bulls that we've been consistently testing. Um, for a period of sort of six months where we've had three cracks over that six months at trying to see how he goes. Um, he was actually one of those bulls in one of these pitches back here. Um, and this is what he's... So this picture here on the right, like that was his sample and he did suffer from three-day. He got a really bad dose of it. Um, and we tested him three times and he never sort of came good and the client decided to don't not continue on with him anymore um but yeah it just again everything no matter what it is in terms of morphology it comes back how do they how they adapt to stress um yeah it's nearly like a borderline temperament you know if they're those good calm balls then they're going to handle curveballs thrown at them but yeah, three day can certainly cause a long term effect. Yeah, right. Eh? Yep. It just at the end of the day, it's your enterprise and what you want to. You know, if he's an exceptional bull, you might be happy to keep him for the twelve months and see how he goes to see how he recovers. Um, yeah, it's it's just one of those things. Like we can give you the information and the tools, and we can keep testing him and see how he goes. But it's, yeah, sometimes they, you know, it might not be a forever thing, but no one's ever kept a bull forever to continually keep testing him. So it's a bit of an unknown as well. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what, yeah, when we do go to test him again. Yep. How he's handled. Yeah, that's it. Um, does it throw us through the calves or any? The three day, like yeah. the oh, not... three day, any semen or? So how, if he handles stress really well, so say your favourite bull contracts three day and we get a lot of this detached heads and we see, a, you know, an ill effect on his morphology, um, the only thing that will show through on his calves is how his calves then handle stress. But they have a 50-50 chance whether they take after their sire or after the dam. So... Um, yeah, it's sort of a bit of a, yeah, yep. catch-22, I guess. But, um, you know, he's also, you've got to give him a little bit of leeway. He's gone through a fairly significant situation to, you know, it's not just like a little chipped his toe on a rock in the paddock sort of thing and he's decided to sook about it. He's, you know, he's been fairly crook and it's expected to be able, you know, you'll see something in him. Yeah, yeah. No, I greatly appreciate everything you've done. It's been great. No worries. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Uh, we've got a anonymous a question come through the Q&A. Yep. Um, when you buy a bullet of sale with, say, an 85% normal morphology test, then he comes yep. up with a very low percentage normal when you test him at home at a later date how much of a chance should you give him obviously a lot of stress factors with change of feed environment etc yeah so um three to six months yeah 
So, yeah, we generally try to give them... So, on average, a spermatogenesis is 72 to 76 days. Um, so, when we retest a bull, we retest every six to eight weeks. When you sail bulls, we quite regularly get them here in the centre. Um, sometimes they can clear up within that eight to ten weeks. Then sometimes it can take up to six months. So it's really dependent on the bull. But, um, yeah, I guess how much you pay for him and if there's anything else, like it's always handy to have a really good going over him, someone to have a look at his testes, make sure that, you know, they're okay. Was there any other things that you saw um, at the time, you know, of transport? Have they got better? Have they got worse? Any of those sorts of things. But it's, yeah, it's good to give him probably at least six months and depends on what your insurance is too. So when you're depending on the sale, the price of the bull at sale um, and what you've done insurance wise, um, yeah, put him out with cows, give him a bit of time. It's always, yeah, good. At least minimum of sort of that, yeah, eight weeks. And then got another one. What are the minimum morphology and morph motile numbers for a two-year-old bull? Um, so a two-year-old bull, you sort of, he's looking at that age of puberty. Again, it's different with every breed. Um, so you're sort of looking minimum of that 70% morphology, no matter what, um, as long as your other factors aren't. We do, what they do is they do a three, three gradient. You have a fail, which is morphology wise, anything less than 50% normal morphology. You have a qualify, which is 51 to 69% normal morphology. And then they have a tick, which is anything 70 and above. So that's a pass. A qualify, you're still going to get cows in calf and they're ideal to put into a multi-sire herd. Um, but if you're single siring, you want 70% and above um, motility. So in the Australian cattle vets, their minimum for mo crush side motility is actually 30%, which sounds quite low. But when you think about when you're collecting a bull and we're putting him into straws and you're AIing with those straws, most often your straws motility are actually 30 to very rarely 60%, but generally 30 to sort of 40% motile. And in that straw, you've only got 25 million live normal cells. But when you've got an ejaculate in a bull in the paddock and he's depositing the whole ejaculate, which is actually billions of cells, um, it's not such a bad thing that they are only 30%. Like ideally you want them to be higher, but you've got billions at 30% as long as his morphology is good um, going into one cow opposed to, you know, you're still getting successful pregnancies with an AI and your semen straw at 25. Well, it's actually less than that because it works out to be about 12 million live normal Um going into the cow for an AI and quite often success has successful pregnancies. So yeah, just sort of, yeah, depends. I believe I did hear today that they are trying to, ACV are trying to up the standard with your, um, with the vet bull breeding soundness exam up to 50% crush side motility. Um, so I'm not sure how that'll progress, but yeah, it'll be something to keep an eye on. And I've got another question here. Can you potentially detect permanent genetic disorders in morphology prior to calves being born? Ooh. Um, so genetic, in the world of morphology, they genetics like a big, scary, dirty word. They don't like to say anything's genetic. Um, so not really. So in terms of, 
um, their problems been with calves potentially to take permanent. Um, no, I would say not. They are starting to do in the goats and things that we do, we are seeing a lot of um, clients starting to do a lot of genomic testing. So I don't know how that'll transfer over into the cattle beef side of things and whether the dairy industry does a lot of it, but I'm not sure how the beef industry will take it on. Um, but no, in terms of genetic disorders, you can't really tell in morphology. It's more just the structure of the sperm and how it's going to inseminate or create an embryo. Um, so it's like a house. When you're building a house, you have someone come and check your structural soundness of it. And that's basically what, yeah, you're doing with morphology. Um, um, do we have any other questions from anybody else? That might be all our questions for tonight. Yep, no worries. Um, but thank you very much, Jane, for joining us for a webinar. I hope everyone's got a lot out of tonight's webinar. It was very informative. Um, we will have the recording out as well in a couple of days as well for everyone to have a look at again. Or if you've got any further questions, I'm sure Jane's more than happy to answer them if you get in contact with her. Um, so, yes, thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar tonight. And thank you, Jane, for coming on board. No worries. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night.